Well, good morning. My name is Steve Cordell, lead pastor here. Welcome to Crossroads, especially if this is your first time with us. We're really glad you're worshiping today with us. And uh, let's celebrate for a moment. Last weekend, many of you invited friends and family to come along with you. As I spoke about Psalm 23, I invited people to let the Good Shepherd lead their lives. And if they prayed to let God do that, to give them life, uh, we invited them to pick up a booklet called Fresh Start uh, that tells them how to take next steps. And uh, last weekend, we had 72 booklets that were picked up uh, by folks saying, yeah, I want to grow some more. So wasn't that an awesome thing? Uh, let's praise God for that. And um, way to go for all of you who invited somebody with you. And you were invited last week, and you're back here today. We're so glad you are. Welcome. We're so thrilled that you are on the journey with us of following the Lord Jesus. And we're looking today at how we find peace, or in other words, how to get off the crazy train that life sometimes becomes. And so we're going to take a look at Philippians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. If you've got a Bible, you can turn with me there. If you don't have a Bible, you can raise your hands. Ushers will be glad to pass you on. If you don't own a Bible, you can keep it. Uh, but if you can turn your Bible, it's all the way towards the back of the Bible. Philippians, just a short book. Or you can turn it in your app, and it's a lot easier to find on your phone. Just uh, click on Philippians 4. So about 10 years ago, uh, the Steelers last won the Super Bowl. When the game was on, we had most of our family come to our house, and we were all watching the game together. And the game was tight. It was a little bit tense. And uh, at one point, I noticed... Almost all of our family had moved on to the floor and right up in front of the TV, just like, you know, we're trying to go into the game to help them out, you know, to win. And, and uh, they did pull it out. Uh, we all exhaled and celebrated when they won. But, you know, it, it can be kind of tense watching uh, a sporting event, right? Uh, actually, my father-in-law, he's a major Duke basketball fan. He cannot watch a Duke game unless the sound is turned all the way off, because his blood pressure goes up too high if he does, if he hears the sound. In fact, doctors have found that people watching a, a game that they're highly invested in, that their adrenaline levels and other hormones go up just as much as players who are in the game itself. So if you've ever felt tired after watching a tight game, that would be why. Uh, some people, when the game gets really tense, they pray. Uh, now... I've never prayed for uh, a sporting event because I figured the other team they're praying to, so it's a wash, it won't really matter. Um, I had to remind myself, if I'm tense, that, you know, just get a little perspective, it's just a game, and tomorrow will be the same whether they win or lose, and so it'll be all right. Uh, but some tensions in life are not so easily written off. You know, if we are not sure how to pay the bills at the, by the end of the month, well, that tension isn't easily dismissed. Money stress. If you're waiting on a report from the doctor and you don't know what that test result's going to show, sometimes that tension doesn't go away easily. Or if you're concerned about your kids and how they're doing and the direction they're going, uh, that kind of worry can eat at you. That kind of anxiety can grip our hearts. And you know, anxiety in our country is climbing. One out of every four teenage boys in America has an anxiety disorder. Two out of every five teenage girls has an anxiety disorder. Anxiety is the number one mental health issue on college campuses today. In fact, Google searches for the word anxiety have doubled in the last five years. We are swimming in a sea of tension and anxiety as a country. And I know that, this, statistically, uh, that in this room right now, it is likely that quite a number of us had wrestled with anxiety and worry this past week. And some even have a kind of chronic anxiety factor and issue in your life. If that's where you have been and where you are, I know where that is. I shared before, some years ago, I woke up in the middle of the night feeling like somebody had plugged my finger into a light socket. 
my whole body was like tingling, even my scalp. And I thought, what is going on? And I leapt out of bed. I walked around for a couple hours in the morning. I went straight to the doctor and said, what? What's happening? And he checked me out and sat me down and said, Steve, you've had an anxiety attack. And I said, how could I have an anxiety attack? I was sleeping. You know, that's not anxious. And he just kind of looked at me patiently, waiting for my denial to go away. And, and uh, I recognized at that point I needed to learn to deal with stress and with anxiety in a different way than I had. Maybe that's you as well. And the good news is that God helps us with that. Anxiety is not a new thing. Jesus spoke about anxiety. The Apostle Paul noticed enough in his early churches that he had to write some instructions about dealing with anxiety. And one of those places is here in Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And this is what uh, these words say. We just read them a moment ago in the song. It says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. So this passage tells us, let worry trigger prayer. Now, we know what a trigger is. It's an experience that creates an automatic response. So, for example, if you're driving down the highway and you see in your rear view mirror these lights and you hear this sound, what do you do? Yeah, you hear that? You immediately know that's an ambulance. You're going to pull over as soon as you can. You want to let that ambulance by. That's the trigger that we're taught uh, when we hear that. Or let's say you're out in a crowd and suddenly this music comes on. What do you do? Last night, somebody stood up. They were almost ready to stand up. So that's what we do. You know, we hear that. We stand up, take our hat off if you're a guy, if you have a hat on. That's, that's the trigger, you know. And um, if you're at Heinz Field and the Baltimore Ravens run out onto the field, you boo. That's just what you, um, triggers you to do that if you're from Pittsburgh, right? It's just automatic. So Philippians 4, 6 and 7 is teaching us a trigger. When you feel worry... As soon as you experience that, you know that's the trigger to pray. This text tells us, don't be anxious about anything, but prayer, and present your request to God. So if you feel anxious, then the trigger is to pray, and when we pray, the result is peace. Now, the Apostle Paul is the one who wrote these words, and he knew what it meant to deal with stress and even anxiety, because in 2 Corinthians 6, he gives us a little glimpse into his life as an apostle. And he tells us in that chapter uh, that, for one thing, he lived every day in the danger of being killed because there were people after him. He was flogged five times. Uh, think about the, what, the beating that Jesus had before he went to the cross. The apostle Paul had that five different times. And on three occasions, he was beaten with rods by authorities. And then it tell, he also says that he, he was also stoned. Now, that didn't mean he was smoking something, no. What it meant was he was put in a circle and people threw rocks at him trying to kill him. And another time, he was shipwrecked. In fact, he was shipwrecked, shipwrecked three different times. Once, he had to float in the ocean like shark bait for 24 hours as he was on his missionary trips. He had to deal with a lot as an apostle. In fact, 2 Corinthians 11, he goes on to say, I have, I've labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I have known hunger and thirst and have often gone without food. I have been cold and naked. Beside everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for all the churches. Daily pressure and concern for all the churches, that sounds like worry. Paul knew what it meant to deal with stress and worry and even anxiety. When he writes about how to deal with it, it's not out of a theoretical kind of place. It's out of his own experience. He had to face it. We need to know that it's not God's will that we be bound up in worry. I mean, that's not his plan for us. So it says in verse 6, do not be anxious. So how many of you, we'll have a show of hands here, how many of you have ever been told, 
Don't worry. Anybody ever tell you that? Don't worry. That's the raise of hands. Got a lot of that. Okay, now here's another raise of hands. How many of you immediately stopped worrying whenever they said that? It doesn't work, does it? It has no effect to say, don't worry, you know, even if they say be happy. No, it doesn't work. You can't just say to somebody, don't worry. The Apostle Paul's not telling us that. He's not saying, don't worry. He's saying, do something else instead. Okay, you're worrying. That's not God's plan for you. But now here's something else. Here's the trigger. You're going to pray. By prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. So let's take a look at how to pray when we're anxious. If that's the trigger to pray, how do we go about that prayer? Well, first we're told, ask God. By prayer and petition, it says. That's really the same thing. It means ask God as soon as we're aware that we're worrying. And why wouldn't we pray? I mean, why would Paul even need to tell us this? Don't worry, but pray instead. Well, honestly, it's not a natural response to pray when we're feeling anxious. We have to learn that response. Why wouldn't we pray even if we know that's what we're to do? One reason might be that maybe we're concerned it would be selfish to pray for our need. I've heard folks say that. They'll say, well, you know, there's many more people who have bigger problems than I do. I don't need to be bothering God with my problems. And there's all kinds of crises in the world. People are starving. We've got problems in the Middle East. I don't need to bother God with my stuff. Is just small in comparison with that. But verse 6 says, in every situation we're to pray. Every situation. Not just the big stuff. Right? It's not just... A few occasions, like we have some kind of quota, we only can call on God a certain number of times in our life, we have to save him up for the big things. That's not what it is. In every situation. And don't worry, you're not going to be distracting God from his ability to deal with other people and other crises if you ask for yours. Because he is infinite. He's got more power, infinite amount of power, than you can imagine. And so anytime you ask for his help, it does not diminish the help he can give to somebody else. You've been to the Niagara, Niagara Falls? Anybody been there? It's, uh, it's a very amazing sight. You just feel the power, the pounding water going over those falls. Now, at the falls, there's 750,000 gallons flowing over there per second. So knowing that, would you be concerned about getting, you know, taking eight ounces for a glass of water out of the falls? You think that might be robbing somebody else of their, you know, water? No. Listen, God's power is so much greater than your need. His power is infinite. So he can give his full attention to you and his full attention to the Middle East. It's okay. He is infinite. So we're told in every situation. I believe that your worry qualifies under every situation. Not just the big ones, because if you think, well, I'll just wait for the big stuff, what you're saying is, God, you stand over there, and um, you know, when I really need you, I'll call on you. But that's not the life that God has called us to live. He wants to be in every moment of our lives. That's his purpose, for us to do life with him. And so because of that, when we, in every situation, pray, we're connecting with him, with our whole life. We're not preserving part of our life for ourselves and, and, and boxing him out. And that is the, uh, another reason that we might not pray when we are worrying. That is, it might be out of an attitude of self-sufficiency. Even if we don't know it, we might be thinking, uh, I'll just take care of this, God. You don't need to help. We are taught that a responsible adult will take care of their own Issues and affairs. You know, they won't rely on somebody else. You want to be self sufficient. When we don't pray, we're saying to God, I don't need you. I got this. I'll handle this myself. That really is the underlying assumption when we don't pray. I heard a story about a couple at a five star restaurant, and the waiter brings the food. It looks and smells amazing. The husband says, wow, let's dive in. And the wife says, well, honey, when we're at home, you always pray before we eat. And he says, 
I don't need to here because this cook knows how to prepare food. I'm okay with that. Yeah. <laughs> you only pray when you feel like you need to. <laughs> but we always need to is the reality. Kyle Adaman is an author and a pastor. And some years ago, he planted a church in Los Angeles. And uh, he found that the, uh, the task was daunting and it was overwhelming him. And he was working, you know, 70 hours a week, and his wife would say, take a day off. And he would say, oh, I can't do that. And so he started having trouble sleeping, and he started taking sleeping pills. And one night, he had this awareness. He, he, he had the idea and this feeling that God was laughing at him. And he thought, that is really odd. Why would God be laughing at me? And he found out five years later. He and his wife were moving, and the last thing out of the house was his big, heavy office desk. And he was pushing it, you know, inch by inch across the floor of his office when his little four-year-old came running up and said, Daddy, I want to help. And so he said, all right, come on and help. And so the two of them were pushing this desk across the office floor. And then after a minute, his son turns to Kyle and says, Daddy, you're in my way. And so Kyle says, oh, okay, and stepped aside and let his son have at it. And, of course, the four-year-old couldn't budge the desk an inch, you know, and was pushing and pushing, and guy was kind of laughing at that. So, look, he, he thought that he was pushing the desk, and then it dawned on him. That's why God was laughing at me five years ago, because he saw my efforts and attitude. I thought I was pushing this church into existence when it was really the power of God doing it. He was just letting me help. I don't know what you're pushing across your proverbial floor right now, but I know this, it's the power of God that moves it. Prayer is the power of God. When we pray, we are leaning into his power, and that's why we're told in every circumstance, every situation to pray, because we're to live our lives in every aspect powered by the Holy Spirit. That's his intent for us. When we don't pray, we are essentially telling ourselves and God, I'll take care of this myself. But I think maybe the most fundamental reason and the most frequent reason, if we really drill down, the, the reason we don't pray is we're not convinced it'll make a difference. We're not really convinced that anything will change when we pray. But let me ask you this. Will worry change what you're facing? Will, when you worry enough, will that make things different in your life? Jesus says, no. In Matthew 6, 27, he says, can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? We know the answer to that. The answer is no. We can shorten our life if we worry enough. We can shorten that, but we can't lengthen it. Worry will not accomplish anything. In fact, people who research these sort of things found that 85% of the things that people worry about never happen. Is that true for you? 85% of the things that we worry about never happen. And that means that almost always, worry is a lie. Worry says this disaster is going to befall and you can't do anything about it and you're not going to be able to handle it. But that's a lie. That's not true. I mean, it's shown statistically to not be true. And for the 15% that does happen, what's found is that it's not nearly as bad as people had imagined. And even when it is, they're able to handle it. Worry is a lie. It's telling you something that's not going to happen. And it doesn't change anything, except it robs you of the life that God wants for you, ties you up, keeps you from taking steps of faith. Worry is a lie because it doesn't change anything, but prayer does. Prayer changes things. The best motivation for prayer is answered prayer. When we know that our prayer makes something happen, when we, when, when we pray and God moves, we want to pray again. That's why we pray for each other in small groups. It's important to know that people are praying for us. And not only that, it's really quite uh, a faith builder and fun when you can pray for each other in the small group and then watch over the weeks and see how God answers those prayers, it's like, wow, yay God, and, and we get to be on the, right in the front lines of seeing him at work in people's lives. It's fun. 
Now, uh, a while about last year or so, I, uh, I decided I needed to ask my small group to pray for something for me. I, I don't really like to do that too often, honestly, but that's just the pride part of me, you know. But I had to be, admit that for a couple of years, I had been kind of stressing over this retaining wall in the back of our house because it held up a significant portion of our yard and it was failing. And I thought, wow, if this thing goes, that not only that part of the yard goes, but it's probably going to compromise the driveway. And uh, so I had different contractors come in and give me a bids and they were all super expensive bids. I would look at these bids and I think, are you kidding? They should just buy another house. You know, it was crazy. So I, I didn't know what to do. For a couple of years, it was kind of weighing on me. And then one day at small group, I thought, all right, I should ask the group to pray for me. And so in our little breakout time, I said, all right, uh, would you pray for this issue? And so they did. Don't you know, the next week, I had a contractor come in, very reputable, been in business 50 years, come in and gave me a bid that was one-third the amount of all these other bids. I looked at that bid. I thought, I can afford that, sold, that's great. And I was anxious. I told the group the next week, look what happened. I was two years struggling with this thing. And I asked you guys to pray. And then, wow, a week later, there it is, God's answer. And I was giving high fives, not just for me, but for them, because they were able to see, wow, prayer makes a difference. And it does. Now, prayer is not a formula. It's not a mechanical experience. It's a relational experience. It's not about pressing a button. It's about leaning into the living God's presence in our life. It's our relationship with him. So it's not easy to understand or explain prayer, but it's simple to pray. That's what we need to know. So we're told, if you're worried, if you're anxious, make that trigger a request to God. And we're told that that request uh, has another qualifier to it. And that is to thank God. So we ask God for what we need, and then we thank God for what he's already done in our lives, what he's already given us, what he has done to answer our prayer in the past. When we do this, not only does it shape our character, but notice this, it will also help us to overcome the three obstacles to prayer we just talked about. When we thank God for what he has done and how he's answered prayer in the past, first of all, it assures us we're not selfish because we're grateful. That's the opposite of selfish. And it reminds us we're not self-sufficient, that we're thanking him because we've received something from him. So we're not just drilling into our own, uh, our own self-sufficiency. And thirdly, when we say thank you, God, for how you have answered prayer and acted in the past, It reminds us prayer makes a difference. It changes things. We've received. We're giving thanks for what we've received, and that builds our faith. In the end, prayer is the antidote to worry because prayer can bring irrational peace. Verse 7. It's right on the heels of verse 6. It tells us to pray. Verse 7 then next says, And the peace of God which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace that transcends all understanding, that's a real polite way of saying it doesn't even make sense. Uh, It will guard your hearts, that is how you feel. It will guard your mind, that is what you think. It doesn't even make sense. It's irrational peace that comes to us. When we first started Crossroads Church, we had a plan on how we were going to get up and running. It was to make 15,000 phone calls into this area. And our small launch team went after it. We had some volunteers from other churches that helped us make calls. We would call people and say, "Uh, do you go to church anywhere? And if they would say yes, we'd hang up and say, God bless you. But if they said no, then we would say, uh, do you want to hear about the one we're going to start? And if they said they would, we would send them some information. And we knew by experience that If we made 15,000 phone calls, we could expect about 150 people at the opening service. And that was important because if you start too small as a church, then you have a real hard time getting enough momentum to grow and sometimes even to survive. So I knew we needed to hit a pretty good number right out of the gate to avoid that kind of problem. And so we're going to make 15,000 phone calls. But here's the thing. 
even though our team was very dedicated, worked really hard, it was just not a really big team and we didn't have a lot of time. So in the end, uh, we were doing the very best we could, but one night while I was sleeping, I woke up, seems to be a theme here, uh, I woke up in the middle of the night and it hit me, we're not going to make 15,000 calls. We're doing the best we can, but that we might make 5,000 calls. Just a third of the number. Wow, how's that going to impact our first service and our future as a church? I'd moved my family out here, had the denomination that invested, and my bosses were kind of watching what we are doing. I'm not on track to, to hit the number I was thinking we would. Will we survive? You know, these thoughts kept going on and on. And then I thought, wait a minute, Steve. You prayed for a year and a half about this church plant idea. And you know what? You became convinced God's in it. And so if God's in it, you're doing all you can. You're working as hard as you can, and you're doing your best. If, God's, if this is God's idea and God's power is going to make it go, it's up to him to make it, make it go. And peace came over me. I laid down, went back to sleep. Peace that passes understanding. And by the way, we had 134 people that showed up for that very first service of Crossroads Church, and we were able to grow from there. The peace that passes understanding is a result of prayer that asks God in a thankful way. That's why anxiety is to trigger prayer. Let anxiety lead you to the throne of God because he will hear. That kind of trigger is helpful for us. And I know that there's some here today that maybe a doctor told you you needed to have some medication for anxiety. That's a, don't feel bad about that. Uh, it might create for you then the opportunity to build this habit of going to God, asking with thanksgiving for what you need. 1 Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. The reason we can give God our issues is because we know he sees us, loves us, and cares about us. So let's do that right now. Let's pray and give to God that which concerns us. Lord Jesus, we thank you that you don't leave us to just cope with life on our own or even just guided by some principles that you give us, but rather, Lord, you come to us personally. You come alongside us. You would live and dwell within us. And I thank you, Lord, for today, that reminder that when we feel worry and anxiousness, it's the trigger prayer which leads to peace. And so I pray right now, Lord, for every person who's come into this room feeling suffocated by worry or chained with anxiety. I pray you would break those chains by the power of the Holy Spirit according to your promise. Lord, I pray that you would bring freedom today for each person, Lord. And I know that you have a purpose for every one of us here today, Lord, in, in, in hearing this, that you have a path for us, Lord, an individual and a unique one. And I pray, Lord, that you would be uh, just shattering, Lord, those, that oppression that, that anxiety or worry has over many hearts here because, Lord, you are the one who brings freedom. You care for us. You love us. Make that truth dwell within us, Lord. Help us to ignore the lie of worry, but instead to bask in the reality of your loving care. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.